All right, so I am excited to chat with Dr. Sabrina Soltz about the carnivore diet. And about Dr. Sabrina, she is a naturopathic doctor located in Scottsdale, Arizona. She practices regenerative and anti-aging medicine and uses carnivore and animal-based diets as part of her treatment protocols to heal everything from autoimmune disorders to chronic pain. And uh, welcome. Thank you so much for joining us, Sabrina. Thank you so much for having me to be here. Yeah. And um, yeah, definitely uh, one of the shorter bios, you know, you get right to the point, just the important stuff. So I appreciate that. <laughs> Not a real long, lengthy bio. So, so thank you for that. And um, yeah, so why don't we start usually just like a lot of podcast hosts do just by diving into the person's background. So Dr. Sabrina, if you could let us know, how did you start getting into the carnivore diet? Cause for, cause I actually did some research. I listened. So I heard that you weren't always carnivore, that you loved your salads. So why don't you talk a little bit about that and how you made that transition? Yeah, it's, it's, gosh, it was a really interesting journey for me. Um, as you know, as you said, I'm a naturopathic doctor. So naturopathic medical school, everything is all about how plants are the greatest thing in the entire world. Everything from putting your patients on plant-based diets, vegan diets, getting the right amounts of fiber. And then of course there's the botanical medicine aspect of it too, right? All plants can technically be medicine to some degree as well. So it was really like driven home in our education that there's no like harm in consuming plants, right? And I say that with quotations because, you know, we know now and of course, we know in general that there are some plants that are incredibly harmful to human beings. So fast forward, I or I should say backtrack a little bit. I've had digestive issues almost my entire life. And it was one of those things that just became really debilitating over time. Um, I My diet became so severely limited. I had removed pretty much everything, all gluten, dairy, soy, um, all sort, every, pretty, every grain pretty much, right? I had gotten down to basically vegetables and meat and some you know other fats and stuff like that like i would do like nut butters and things and i still never got better and as an md of course i had access to every single gut healing protocol you could imagine i did all the biohacking i did the stem cell stuff i did like i did it all over the course of you know my career and i still never got better and in fact a lot of the things a lot of things are worsening as far as my symptoms went and so fast forward to uh about a year ago my husband came across another physician named Dr. Anthony Chafee on YouTube, and he was talking about the carnivore diet. And Dr. Anthony Chafee is fantastic. He's a neurosurgeon based in Australia, and he's been carnivore for about a decade, if not longer. So he's a huge wealth of information on the subject as well. And he's probably the most strict as far as carnivores go. He really just preaches the meat, salt, and water variation. And so my husband, he had some stuff that he was going through at that time, and he just dove in head first. He's really uh, crazy like that. And I thought he was completely insane. I was like, you're going to make yourself sick. You need fiber. You need vegetables. You're, you're going to just die and I'll just pick up the pieces. And then he didn't and he got better and his skin texture improved. It was brighter. The, the whites of his eyes were brighter. He had more energy. His mood was more even. He like really didn't lose his temper at the kids anymore. It was pretty wild to see. And I was like, okay, maybe there's something to this. Maybe I need to be more open-minded about what the possibilities could be. So I started first by just eliminating my salads that I ate for lunch every single day, literally ate a salad every single day for lunch. And I never figured out like, oh, after lunch, I would not feel good. I might pain in my upper back and neck would light up. I would get some brain fog. It was just no good cut that out. Those things started to go away. And then that like little bit of like lower belly fat that I used to have just kind of went away on its own too. I was like, okay, maybe there's something to this. So it took me a few months, but I eventually got rid of all other like grains in my diet. I think I, I was still consuming oats and white rice. And so those all went away as well. And then I started to improve my digestion that had been a problem for so many years. It did go through some variations. I went through a period of time where I was using some digestive enzymes because the high fat that I was eating just still wasn't digesting as well as it should have been. Um, and of course, I the other aspect too was prior to that, what really kind of set everything off really terribly was uh, back in like May of 2021, we went on a trip to Mexico and I picked up a parasite. And that parasite had really destroyed my gut over 
the almost year that I had it after that. So carnivore really, I feel did save me. It saved me from a lot of the things that I was going through again, completely healed the gut stuff, got rid of anxiety. My sleep's improved. I take almost no supplements anymore. Um, if you were to see my house, we literally have two big cupboards full of supplements, full of things that I've taken in my life. I've become the most low maintenance in my health that I've ever been. It's been, it's been amazing. Yeah, that's a um, yeah, great story. As again, just to be transparent, and I mentioned this prior to the prior to press record that I don't follow carnivore. That you know, like you last year, you know, I recommend vegetables, and you know, I have my morning smoothie. So, and and I'm not, you know, I'm, I'm obviously not opposed to carnivore. Else, I wouldn't be interviewing you. I'm very open minded, and I the reason I'm chatting with you is because I I've heard stories about carnivore helping people with chronic health conditions, including autoimmunity. I work with people with Graves and Hashimoto's. And, you know, just again, to be transparent, I've had patients who don't seem to tolerate vegetables. I mean, I, I would say a lot of them, see, at least see, on the surface, seem to, but then there are those that obviously they'll, you know, they try to increase their vegetable intake, which is what I've been recommending for years. And then they might experience, experience some bloating, some gas, and, you know, typically I'll attribute it to, you know, well, maybe, you know, you just need, you know, uh, we need to just focus on improving your gut health. Maybe you have SIBO, small intestinal bacteria overgrowth. And um, so, I, you know, I'd love to get your thoughts on that. But yeah, just, uh, you know, just hearing success stories from people who are in similar situations and you know they just change their diet and you know that seemed to resolve things so i was like you know what i'm going to get someone who's you know an advocate and more of an expert on the carnivore diet and that's that's why we're chatting and so can you then differentiate a little bit how this differs from you know like the more popular diets like ketogenic i think there are there's overlap definitely with carnivore and ketogenic and then um you know paleo of course is, is popular aip so, um, cause it's not, I, like you said, I guess there's different levels of carnivore where you could just be strictly meat, but then there's, you know, variations where you can add eggs and dairy. Is that correct? Yeah, totally. So yeah, there is some variation on this and, um, sorry, this lights like in my face, but, um, carnivore diet in general can exist on sort of a spectrum. So the actual term hyper carnivore refers to an animal or person who consumes about 70% of their food intake from an animal source. So that can include eggs, that can include dairy, as long as the person tolerates it. But preferably we like to get most of our nutrition from things like fatty ruminant meats, um, possibly even up pork. Some people do fish variations, seafood, some people even do chicken. And the biggest variation between carnivore and keto, like you were saying, there is some overlap, is that keto really emphasizes doing the, the high fat, right? Because you wanna make sure that you are existing in ketosis. That's not so much the focus of carnivore, so much as it's just getting in the fatty meats and the food from the animal sources. And for a lot of people, I think carnivore is actually preferential over keto. Now, I, I talk about something called the doctor bias, meaning that most doctors are biased to what walks in their office as far as pathology goes. And many years ago when keto first became popular, my bias became that I was seeing a lot of women who are middle-aged who started to do keto in order to lose weight. And after about three months, yes, they lost weight initially, then they plateaued, then their hormones tanked. And I was left cleaning up the mess from that. So I was a little bit jaded on the whole keto thing again, just because of what I saw walking into my office. And what I came to realize was that these women were just severely under nourishing themselves in regards to protein. They were eating so much fat and not getting enough protein to simply support all of the needs that their body has for it. Um, protein is a super essential nutrient, and I would argue that the majority of people walking around are severely under-proteined. Um, Dr. Gabrielle Lyon, she's a, she's a wealth of information in this uh, area as well, as far as ensuring that people get adequate, adequate amounts. General recommendation for most people is roughly one gram per pound of body weight, which seems like a lot, right? You know, uh, me, who's, you know, about just about 110 pounds or so that's 110 grams of protein that's about a pound or more of meat per day now i have no problem consuming that and i feel so much better for it but a lot of people have difficulty because they are also eating other things which is you know where the other diets come in right so paleo does still allow room for certain plant matter so basically anything that would have grown during the paleolithic era they say is okay to have in that diet i might even argue that a lot of the plants and stuff that we have 
today likely didn't exist back then just due to the simple hybridization and whatnot that we do in our, in our current um, agriculture industry. When it comes to something, a lot of people compare carnivore to the Atkins diet because it's that high protein based diet with good amounts of fat and really severely limiting carbs. And I would say that would be probably the closest comparison to a popular diet, but still mainly avoiding vegetables. And ultimately, a lot of people on this diet are avoiding pretty much all plant matter in general. So that includes nuts, it includes seeds, and of course, obviously vegetation. This, some people will still consume fruit because arguably when we're talking about avoiding plants, we are discussing the fact that plants contain anti-nutrients that can be more harmful to somebody's health than the benefits that you might get from consuming that item. When it comes to fruit, we can argue that, well, Technically, the plant wants you to eat its fruit so that you'll eventually go poop out the seeds and start a new plant so it can actually reproduce a lot better. That's why they make the fruit very sweet, very appetizing to humans. It definitely makes you want to continue to eat that. But ultimately, again, we want to make sure that we're staying away from all the other anti-nutrients. And like you were saying, there are some people that can definitely tolerate eating vegetables. But there are a lot of us that have just been sick for so long and have done so much damage to our gut and so much damage to our body that we've completely lost that ability. And I do I think this diet is for everybody? You can argue that maybe this is our, you know, we're that we're obligate carnivores and this is how we should be eating. But I think that there's also a lot of complexity to as human beings, right? We have this ability to be creative with our food sources as they come to us in the environment and to ferment things and we've learned how to cook things and we're not just relegated to eating animals in the raw and in the wild right and i think that there's something to be said for that too so you mentioned protein and I, i've had some other guests talk about protein um you, you know cynthia thurlow she was on the podcast and she agreed uh, as far as the one gram of protein per pounds of you know per, per pounds and one thing though when it comes to like spacing out the proteins, you personally, like, do you have like breakfast, lunch, dinner, and then have like, you know, what you said, you're, you're 110. So do you have like 30 to 40 grams per protein per meal? Or do you incorporate like intermittent fasting like Cynthia does and, you know, just um, try to have like two meals per day or? Honestly, I just kind of go by my hunger cues. And that was one of the things that really became interesting with learning when I'm actually hungry. I feel like a lot of people miss out on that. They actually never got a chance to learn what it feels like to wait for their body to simply want to eat something. And so with that, some days I'll start my day and I'll have bacon and eggs in the morning. Uh, most days though, I eat my first meal sometime between 11 a.m. and 2 p.m. just depends when I'm actually hungry. And my first meal is actually usually like a one pound ribeye with a bunch of butter and salt on it. It's delicious. And dinner time, I, I'll have sometimes I'll have burgers. I can I'll sometimes have ribs. I might do bacon or eggs again. And then like a dessert for me is usually like a small cup of some full fat sugar-free yogurt, um, which interestingly, I think I mentioned earlier that I used to be dairy free. Carnivore got me back my ability to eat dairy. I can now eat cheese. I can do yogurt. I can do heavy cream. Um, it's pretty spectacular. I no longer react to dairy. Do you eat certain types of dairy, like raw dairy, or do you just make sure it's organic? So the, the yogurt that I like is actually a conventional dairy, and I just love the texture of it. It's like thick like ice cream. Um, but most of the time, we, we've we gotten raw dairy. We'll go for the organic stuff if, you know, whenever we get it. Um, but yeah, it's none of it bothers me anymore, like at all. It's phenomenal. Yeah. So there's no like thresholds as far as you know, with a lot of people that are lactose intolerant. So they might be able to tolerate smaller amounts of dairy, but it doesn't seem to make a difference with you. No, I, I'm, oh my gosh, I went through this phase when I was going into carnivore and I think my body was just really trying to do a bunch of repletion from just years of me being so deficient and stuff. And looking back, I never really had a great source of calcium in my diet. So I entered this phase of carnivore where all of a sudden my body was just craving yogurt. Like it was the only thing I wanted. And I went through probably a month where I ate one of those big containers of yogurt almost every single day. And it was, it felt so good. Like it gave me so much energy and it was a sugar, like there's no sugar added to it. It was completely plain as day. And I just devoured them. And I think it was just my body trying to catch up from all of that, from all the deficit. Um, Cause you know, 
in addition to the gut stuff, there was also adrenal stuff and there was all the stress stuff and thyroid stuff. And again, you just set your body up for rampant mineral deficiencies existing in that state for so long, especially consuming all the vegetables I was consuming. Um, a lot of the vegetables, I mean, regardless of if a person tolerates, tolerates them or not, they're still going to contain oxalates. They're still going to contain lectins. They're still going to contain things like phytic acid. And all of those things are not only going to be a mineral tax on your body, meaning your body needs minerals to actually break those things down and metabolize them, but they're going to block and blunt mineral absorption from the foods that you're currently eating too. So one of the things that I work on with my patients and working on with myself was just simply rampant mineral repletion for a lot of people. Can, can you talk more about that? So you just like recommend for them to supplement with, with minerals uh, just separately? Yeah. So the ones that I really like to use are the Quinton ones. Um, I'm not sure if you're familiar with those. They come in little glass ampules, but they're actually sourced from a plankton bloom that's been around for gosh, probably hundreds of years. This, this product itself has been around for a very long time. And they actually used to use it to restore blood volume loss in uh, soldiers. But it is, it's got a wide spectrum of pretty much all the micro and trace minerals that we need in addition to the macro ones like magnesium and whatnot too. It's a really great product. Uh, you, I think you mentioned fiber earlier, and that's one of the concerns when it comes to like not only carnivore, but ketogenic, you know, if you're not eating your veggies, where are you going to get your fiber from? So I, I'm sure you have a response to that. The short version is that we actually don't need fiber for our digestive system to run smoothly. And uh, there's another doctor that um, he wrote a really excellent blog post. His name is Dr. Kiltz. I can get you the link if you want to share it in the show notes with your uh, viewers. But he completely sure. debunks in that blog post all of the reasons why we actually don't need fiber. And it's because, well, the way that I really simplistically break this down and my like reasoning for the carnivore diet is a couple things. One, what we are made of is technically muscle meat and saturated fat, right? Our fat is solid at room temperature, it's saturated. So if we're gonna consume food to repair things in our body that break down, well, it's the whole you are what you eat thing, right? Or you should eat what you are. So the consuming of the animal proteins and the animal fats is what's gonna actually work to replete any of damages in our animal protein and our animal fat. Additionally, no part of us is made of cellulose, right? And we don't actually need that fiber in our diet to bulk up our stool. I promise you, I, I joke that I'm going to like start a subscription page where I just post pictures of my daily poops to prove that they are perfect. <laughs> but there's really, there's no issues with that whatsoever. And the other side of that too, is that there's no essential nutrients that humans require that have to be, that have to be consumed in plant form. All the nutrients that we need are actually the most bioavailable in animal protein. And in fact, there are a great deal of nutrients that are only available in animal protein, meaning you can't get them from any sort of plant sources. Things like B12, carnitine, um, certain fatty acids as well, too. Yeah, I'm glad you brought up the, the pooping because I definitely was going to ask you about that, uh, the, the bowel movements. And do, do you find that people making the transition, let's say, from just a standard American diet, or, you know, let's say even they're eating a healthier paleo diet and they make transition to carnivore. Is there a transition period where they might be constipated initially? There's a transition period where you don't want to trust a fart. There's actually a transition period where your stools get looser because there's now simply no more fiber blocking the, uh, blocking the transit, right? So the fiber, it bulks up your stool. It slows down the transit. When you remove that out of the way, it actually cures constipation. And there actually was a study done that said a low or no fiber diet actually cures irritable bowel syndrome. Hmm, interesting. How about meat preparation? Is there a certain way you recommend to prepare the, the meat, you know, more you know rare or medium well? You're going to get the most bioavailability out of the nutrients, especially with the heme iron, if you cook it more on the medium rare to rare side. But then again, it's up to the person, whatever they like, whatever they enjoy. Um, we have something called an auto grill, and it's a type of grill they use in restaurants where it's actually a... Um, a burner on the top and you put the steak underneath and you kind of lift it up with a gradient. And we also use a pellet grill. Um, arguably pellet grills, they burn really clean versus using something that um, has like coals or, or gasoline. So we try to, you know, 
reduce any risk that could come from the idea of charring your meat. Okay, so you said those are called an auto grill and a pellet grill? Yeah, auto, O-T-T-O, -T -O, uh, grill. That's just one of the brands. I have no affiliation with them at all. It's just one that we have, but there are, there are other companies that make similar types of grills. And then, yeah, pellet grill. So it basically uses uh, wood pellets to create the... Um, the heat source that's actually going to cook your meat and like i said they burn really really clean so you're very dramatically reducing any sort of risk of things like the carcinogenic material now a lot of people follow ketogenic because as you mentioned it's you know you get into ketosis and you know they do it for a lot of people for weight loss uh, i imagine with carnivore though a lot of people will lose weight just because also you're not eating carbohydrates yeah, you're completely changing your response to insulin by switching to a diet that really contains almost no carbohydrates, which is good for most people. My husband and I were actually having a discussion with somebody not too long ago. And, you know, babies, humans, when we're born, we're born into ketosis. And as long as we're, you know, nursing um, from our mothers from being breastfed, we maintain ketosis, which you could argue is the preferred state for humans because of all the things that it allows the body to heal, right? We see so much research on keto is this cure for this disease and it treats this disease. And it's like, well, is keto actually the cure for those diseases or is ketosis simply the natural state that humans should be existing in? And those diseases are a result of us leaving that state, right? It can go both ways. So I would argue that yes, being in ketosis is certainly a favorable state and you can get to that without actually doing a keto diet, but by simply doing a variation of intermittent fasting. And I definitely do, I do like intermittent fasting personally. I don't actively practice it because I know that I'm going to be in it no matter what, just simply because of how I plan my meals and how I eat my meals. I usually only eat a couple times a day at most. Um, so I ultimately end up fasting by default. But I really think that there's something to be said with making sure that you are at ketosis because if you think about it, the wide majority of Americans or wide majority of people likely haven't been in ketosis since they were born. And so they're missing out on all the benefits that are coming, that are going to come with that. Now, you know, I mentioned earlier, a lot of the listeners have either Graves disease or Hashimoto's and, you know, what Hashimoto's, a lot of those people will want to lose weight. Now what, with hyperthyroidism graves, it varies. I mean, when I dealt with graves disease, I lost 42 pounds and a lot of people lose weight, but you know, there are people with hyperthyroidism who gain weight, but I'm bringing this up because let's say the, let's bring up the situation of somewhat hyperthyroidism and they're losing a lot of weight, but they're concerned with getting enough calories from just eating meat. Or, or maybe the concern is just, you know, I'm going to have to eat a lot of meat, to, you know, just, uh, you know, to try, I mean, and the goal I'll, I'll say before getting into this, of course, you want to lower the thyroid hormone levels. That's the reason why the person is losing weight. So no matter how much meat you eat, you might not, you know, gain weight, you might maintain, or you might st still lose weight. But I guess, is there a concern about eating too much meat? I haven't seen it, honestly. So it's so interesting because people will say, oh, you eat so much meat, it's going to hurt your kidneys. I had, I had a patient not too long ago and she was, I forget what her main issue was. Um, she had multiple things that came up. One of them being low thyroid function, low hormone levels, high stress levels. Um, and I believe she also had an underlying autoimmune disorder, but I say all that to kind of set the stage with our, the recommendations that I gave her and her kidney function. When she came to me, I want to say her EGFR was just below 70. And I actually told her to switch her diet to a carnivore based diet. Her EGFR two months later went up to over 80. And so she switched basically what she did was she stopped eating the carbohydrates that she was eating, switched to the carnivore based diet. And that actually allowed her kidney function to heal and repair kidney protein does not damage the kidneys whatsoever. It is carbs that damage the kidneys. You really can't eat too much protein because your satiation signals, your hunger uh, signals, those are going to start to work properly and you simply can't overeat it. You put a big, you know, big piece of steak in front of somebody and you put a potato next to it. And if they're eating the steak with the potato, the carbohydrates are actually going to interfere with your proper hunger signaling and cues. If you give a person just the steak and they only eat that, they're going to eat it and they're going to eat it ravenously until their hunger cues start to catch up and then they're going to stop. 
you find that people will actually eat like less on this way of eating because their hunger cues are so on point and they actually get feedback when they're full versus again eating the carbs combined with the meat and this leads to something else too that a lot of people aren't taught about or a lot of people don't know even providers and it's the Rand the randall cycle uh, Professor Bart Kay, he's, uh, he's on YouTube, he's great, he has a really wonderful detailed explanation of how the Randall cycle works, but the short version is that if you are eating carbohydrates in combination with fat or with protein, you're actually not going to get almost any energy absorption from any of those because of how it activates something called the Randall cycle. So you're almost always going to store those carbs as fat when you're eating them in combination because ultimately carbs don't really exist in nature combined with fats or combined with protein, whereas protein and fat exist in nature very, very well. You can eat those together. You will get proper uh, satiation signaling and you'll actually get really great energy absorption too. If a person is concerned about simply getting enough calories, extra, extra fat is going to be the thing. I mean, people will live, like people on the carnivore way of eating will sometimes just like snack on butter and it helps you stay full. It helps you stay satiated. It really is an easy thing to do. Just upping those fat levels. Now, interesting what you said about the kidneys, the, the EGFR actually increasing when switching to carnivore. You, you might not know the answer to this, but if you had to guess, would you say maybe that oxalates were put, damaging the, the kidneys, putting stress on the kidneys, and that's why when they switched to the carnivore diet, the kidney function improved? For this patient, I do think the oxalates played a role, absolutely, but I think ultimately it was mainly the carbs. And this is a, this is, something that's going to apply to pretty much every American, right? Like your kidneys do not like having to clear excess sugar from your blood. And that's going to, that's, what's going to take. That's, this is why diabetics have to go on dialysis, right? All that excess sugar intake causes that kidney damage and, and sets them up for kidney, kidney failure. Now, have you seen patients of yours get into remission? Like, like with autoimmunity where they're, you know, they, they're flaring up and, you know, again, they're on the paleo or AIP diet and they switch to carnivore and then everything calms down and then, you know, gradually over time or who knows, maybe quickly they get into remission. A hundred percent. Predominantly my rheumatoid arthritis patients, those ones seem to respond the absolute best to carnivore. And I think it's because we're finally taking away the oxalates, which are going to they love to deposit in joints. And if you look at an oxalate under a microscope, it's basically like a ball with spikes. So you can kind of cause like an oxalate based arthritis syndrome on top of a rheumatoid arthritis syndrome, right? The body's already attacking the joints. You're depositing more crystals in there because your immune system simply doesn't know how to clear them as well as the average person from the body. That has made the biggest difference. And for those who are concerned about saturated fat and the effects of meat on cardiovascular disease, you know, that also has been debunked. And, and, and I guess we also should say before I forget that I assume you're recommending healthier forms of meat, you know, like grass fed, you know, pasture raised, not just going, you know, just eating conventional raised meat. Yeah, I tell people, you know, even a conventionally raised piece of meat is going to be way better better than the best crap that you're previously buying. So purchase what you can in a way that's affordable for you and things that you like to eat, and it's still going to be good. So when you're eating the meat, you, you kind of bank on the animal and their ability to excrete the toxins and to process it before it actually makes its way into its own meat and gets to you. And there have been studies done that, yes, there is a variation in things like the um, fatty acid composition as far as omega-3s versus omega-6s in grass-fed versus uh, grain-fed or conventionally raised animals. But for the most part, it's not going to make a big difference in a person going from a standard American diet who's switching to carnivore. And ultimately, we, again, we want this to be manageable and affordable for people to do. So if all that they can if all they can do is, you know, conventional burgers, for example, go for it. Again, it's still going to be way better than like a packaged TV dinner that they might have eaten before. Um, and then as far as the saturated fat and the cardiac concerns go, this is so interesting. It's from what I've seen and the experience that I've had with my patients and what I've seen in the literature, it's not necessarily the saturated fat that's the problem. It's more so the polyunsaturated fats and the high sugar. And the combination of these two things is actually what I believe is the underlying cause of most cardiovascular diseases. 
again, simply because we are mainly made of saturated fat. It is our preferred source to rebuild things like our joints, our fatty tissue, the myelin sheath that's surrounding every single one of our nerves, again, all the cushioning in, in our joints. It's our preferred source. Whereas the polyunsaturated fatty acids, things that are in like the seed oils, like the canola oil, the grapeseed oil, the cottonseed oil, the peanut oil, these are the ones that are actually more detrimental to humans because Again, they're not what we're made of. So when a person's eating these, their body is taking them in and it's saying, okay, this is the building block that we have to do healing and repair. It's not necessarily what we prefer, but this is all we have to use. So we're gonna use it. And this is what we're gonna use to rebuild tissue structures. But this is how we end up with actually cellular dysfunction because our body used a building material that it shouldn't have used in the first place. It was just making do with what it had. So This is where we'll start to see things like bad changes to people's cardiac pictures or cardiovascular system. We might even start to see things like cancer growth, tumor growth, just the body behaving how it shouldn't. And this is actually the reason why I, you know, like you saw in our Facebook group, the sunburn thing, why a lot of carnivores don't actually get a sunburn. And it's because our cells have been made with that really strong saturated fat. So right. Every single cell has something called the phospholipid bilayer, which is two layers of fat surrounding it, and it's supposed to be saturated. And that's what makes the cell very strong. A lot of carnivores actually won't get sunburned simply because our cells are made properly and we can actually withstand the UV rays and properly handle them in our systems. Um, my children, for example, over the summer, my daughter is the fairest skin child you've ever seen. She is blonde hair, blue eyes, super fair, swam in the pool every single day, all summer in Arizona, she did not burn once at all. And we never put sunscreen on her. Same with our son. He's a little bit darker skin than she is, but neither of them burn at all. And, you know, once you're, you're removing those bad oils from the diet and you're actually focused more on the saturated fat, you'll just see how things improve. And I tell people just experiment with it, right? Give it 30 days, give it 90 days. If you absolutely hate it, you can totally go back, but it might just change your life. Yeah, that, that is very interesting about the this you know, not not sunburning, uh, not getting sunburned. And uh, you know, I agree with everything you said about the saturated fat. Uh, but I also want to play a little bit devil's advocate. Like if someone comes into your practice, or they, let's say they're working with you and they're following carnivore diet, and, and maybe you don't see this, but if someone were to like do a lipid panel and they have like a total cholesterol of like 230, 240 LDL, you know, a little bit on the higher side, is there any concern with that? Oh, this is so good. So we'll talk about my husband. He won't care that we're talking about him. We, him and I actually did a video on our YouTube channel where I broke down all of his labs that he's had for about the last year because his cholesterol shot up over 400. Wow. Uh, yeah. So, but we also, I don't just do cholesterol panels, right? I run kind of expanded cardiac markers. So we'll look at the PLA2 enzyme. We'll look at MPO, oxidative LDL, small density LDL, your apolipoproteins, A and B, um, HSCRP. It's about as detailed as you can get as far as cardiac goes. And what we discovered was he, we ended up sending him for a CA C score as well. So the coronary artery calcium scan, we found out that he actually has a calcification in his left anterior descending artery, which is, you know, commonly referred to as the wicker. So knowing my husband's history, which he had some really bad habits prior to carnivore, that was actually one of his impetuses for pursuing it was how do I just get rid of all the bad things in my life? He used to eat like a conventional store-bought oven pizza, like just a seed oil, gluten and dairy nightmare with like nightshade sprinkled on top. Like it was, it was, so he was not treating his body very, very well. So he switched to carnivore and all of a sudden everything spiked, right? His cholesterol was over 400. His MPO, his myelo peroxidase was, I think it was like over 3000. His PLA2, which is like the marker of the um, plaque repair was super high as well. And what we realized after we saw this trend and we kept checking and kept checking was that the cholesterol was increasing on purpose, right? So we have to think about cholesterol. Cholesterol is something that our body makes. Why would our cholesterol make something like that, that where its only job is to do harm? It doesn't make any sense. We know that cholesterol is actually the starting molecule for all of our sex hormones. And cholesterol is again, the repair molecule in the body. If something gets damaged in the body, like a blood vessel, 
due to something like high sugar going through and causing nicks and damage in it, the body's going to send cholesterol in there to patch it up, right? So it's not necessarily a bad thing. It's the whole idea of the fire truck being the cause of every fire just because it's at fires. It's not. Cholesterol is not the cause of quote unquote plaque in the artery. It's there to repair. And what the body will do after that is it'll place a calcification over top to protect it from breaking off and running into circulation and causing things like heart attacks or stroke. So what we realized in his situation was, okay, he had this issue. He was eating vegetables and stuff before, and maybe that was keeping his cholesterol low because of the fiber transit in the body. But was this beneficial in his situation? And so he gets on carnivore, everything spikes up, and then everything starts to decline and improve. And I think to myself, wow, did we actually finally just let the body make enough cholesterol to do what it wanted to do as far as healing and repair goes? And this then becomes my argument for all my patients that come in with high cholesterol, because it's usually the picture of the middle-aged person who's coming in with it, right? It's very rarely that we see it in younger people. But what do we know happens in middle age? Things start to break down in the body, hormone production starts to decline. Is it then not logical that your body's going to try to make more of the initial molecule to feed that pathway to help you make more hormones? Of course, right? But then what happens in a traditional office? The doctor prescribes a cholesterol lowering medication. Give it three months, give it six months. What happens? They come back and things are worse. Their fatigue's worse. Their joint pain's worse. In men, they end up getting ED. Right? And it becomes a situation where we have a policy happening and we're giving a prescription to manage the side effects of that prescription while simply just not understanding this basic thing that cholesterol was there to help in the first place. Interesting. So has this cholesterol remain elevated like over time or is it gradually decreasing? It is decreasing and his myeloperoxidase is finally, it went, was over 3000. I think it's now 50 points away from being normal. And his PLA2 enzyme has completely normalized. His apolipoproteins have improved and his triglycerides are super low. His HDL is now nice and high, which I should caveat that. LDL, I will say in, high, in total cholesterol, are a problem and worth looking at in the presence of a low HDL and high triglycerides. If LDL is high and total cholesterol are high in the presence of additionally a high HDL and a low triglyceride, likely not problematic, but still worth looking at at those levels. Because again, HDL is going to be what's actually bringing cholesterol back to the liver to be eliminated by the body. And of course, we know triglycerides are probably the most menacing thing on that cholesterol panel just right out the gate because um, they are the fat bound to the sugar and the thing that's most inflammatory and that can actually lead to liver disease, things like that. What do you like to see triglycerides? Uh, less than 100, less than 75? Less than 100. Um, if I'm being, you know, generous on somebody in their healing journey, I might say up to like 130 or so, but definitely below 100. I think mine currently sit around like 60. And what are your thoughts on organ meat as well as uh, drinking bone broth? Because a lot of people I'm sure are listening to this. There's, you know, just over the years, you know, I would like when I dealt with Graves disease in 2008, not there wasn't all the bone broth uh, powders. And, you know, even like when you go into the, you know, the grocery store, there's a lot of, you know, brands of bone broth. So, uh, you know, so again, there's a lot of talk about bone broth for gut healing, um, which, you know, I, I think is valid, but, you know, I'd like to get your thoughts about, you know, drinking bone broth, you know, um, eating organ meats. Yeah. So organs, I never really ate the organ meats. I did some organ capsules for a while at the beginning part of my carnivore journey, just for extra energy. And I really did stop those. I don't take them anymore. I don't really think that they're necessary. I think that they can be used strategically if you have a lot of uh, nutrient deficiencies to correct and you want to do it quickly. I think they're they're a good choice for that, but they're not necessary. So if somebody's like, oh, I can't do carnivore because I can't, you know, eat nose to tail. They like, don't even worry about it. Like I've never eaten a piece of organ meat in my life and I am totally fine with that. Um, when it comes to the... Um, Sorry, the other aspect, you just asked me about something else. I just told it to think on it. Um, it was bone broth. Oh, bone, bone broth. broth. Yes, 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 bone broth. I love bone broth. I think it's great. I think for a lot of people, um, it can be a really good addition to making things exciting. Like if you're cooking a piece of meat in a crock pot and you want to add some bone broth to help cook that, I think it's awesome. If you want to use it as just like a cup of something to drink in the morning instead of coffee, a lot of people do that too. But 
making sure that you're getting one that is as high quality as is in budget for you and making sure you're also not getting one that has a lot of extra things like spices and whatnot added to it, especially if you are super sensitive going into this. Because again, those spices are going to be made from things like peppers, which are going to be nightshades, which are going to have, you know, your anti-nutrients that we're trying to avoid. Now, I know both you and your husband are, you know, very physically fit and carnivore, I'm sure plays a role in that, but I'm, I'm thinking exercise as well. Do, do you do and recommend like like resistance exercise or can, can you briefly talk about that yeah the main things that i recommend for my patients are resistance training and you don't need a lot of it 20 minutes three times a week of just moderate weightlifting, lifting uh, and it's going to be actually super easy for people to put on muscle and put on strength eating carnivore because of the high protein that you're taking in your body's going to use it to heal and repair and then i just recommend that people walk there is research that you know walking is the best exercise for maintaining longevity and just increasing movement. I never really recommend high intensity cardio training or anything like that. Um, Cause I think you can get the biggest body composition changes and do it in a way that's manageable for most people and doesn't make them hate exercise by just doing the light walking and three days a week of resistance training. Yeah, interesting. Okay, so three weeks, uh, th three days a week, 20 minutes. And then walking every day for what, like maybe 30 minutes or an hour? You, or? Yeah, if you can get 20 or 30 minutes in a day, that's great. If you can only get in a few days a week, that's great too. Um, ultimately, I think that the important thing is to, to have functional movement in our bodies, especially as we start getting older, right? Not every person needs to be you know, learning how to do certain types of squats or doing bicep curls. I think for most people, it really comes down to how can I just continue to move my body in a healthy way so that I stay mobile as I get older. At least that's what I see a lot in my practice. I get a lot of people coming to me with a lot of joint issues and whatnot. Now, one important question I need to ask you is you mentioned pizza before. So, you know, your, your husband used to have the conventional pizza. So now do you not eat pizza or do you make modifications? Because I mean, again, you could have dairy, so you could have, I guess, mozzarella cheese and you could have the meat. So, so yeah. Any, any pizza over the last year since you made this transition? I've made a carnivore pizza. I actually have a reel on it on my Instagram. So if people want to find me on there, I'm just at Dr. Solt, D-R-S-O-L-T on Instagram. Um, search through my reels. It'll say like the viral carnivore pizza. So we totally made a pizza and it was decent, right? We actually, um, the, the crust was made of like um, shredded chicken and I think I put eggs in there and some Parmesan cheese. We made like an Alfredo sauce. It was, it was pretty good. It was pretty solid, but it's certainly not an everyday thing. We've only done once. And what I actually learned with this way of eating is that I really just like eating one thing at a time. Like it is so much more satisfying for me to just have one thing on my menu versus all these other different flavors. I realize my body doesn't like that as much. All right. Well, thanks for sharing. And anything else? I mean, I'm sure there's a lot more that you could share, but you know, if you, is there anything like really important that I didn't ask you that I should have asked you or anything else that you'd like to discuss before we wrap things up? I think ultimately just letting people know that this is simply an option. If you are like me who has tried everything else and have nowhere else to go and you've really limited your diet and you're still not healing. And I tell people, I, I initially I gave myself 30 days and I was like, if I don't like it after 30 days, like I can always run back into the warm embrace of kale. Right. And that didn't happen clearly, you know, I'm about a year into this and I've, I've never felt better. So give yourself time to ease into it. Um, my husband and I, we do, like you said, we run a Facebook group. Uh, we have, gosh, we're closing in on about 3000 people in that group right now. And we, it's only been around for about six months. And in that group, we share a lot of information. We have a lot of um, people that will coach. My husband actually coaches people on the carnivore diet too. Um, he's actually a certified carnivore coach through a company called Rivero uh, that's started by Dr. Sean Baker. And he's actually the author of the original carnivore diet book. He's, he's a former MD, I believe. So join our group. If you look us up on Facebook, we're uh, carnivore, harder, happier, healthier. And you can also um, check out our, we have an oyster supplement. Yeah, let's that talk about too. that. Yeah. Yeah. So my husband and I, we would eat, we get oysters from Whole Foods pretty much every Friday. And they're only a dollar an oyster. It's like our favorite thing to do because it's the best deal ever. And every time we would do this, we would post one on social media and people would comment, 
I don't like oysters or I wish I liked oysters or I can't get oysters near me. And honestly, if you know anything about oysters, they're like the most underrated superfood ever as far as their mineral concentrations. Um, just overall, they're fantastic as a, as a food. So I was like, okay, how can I get oysters to people? And I'm not sure if you use Fullscript, but Fullscript is like this online dispensary full of literally thousands of different products and there was no oyster supplement on there. So I started looking and I looked on Amazon and every, all the ones that were on Amazon were like gimmicky. They had low concentrations. They had fillers. They couldn't guarantee that they were being tested for heavy metals. Um, so I kind of went on a search, found this guy in Ireland who's a marine biologist who has this company and we actually sourced our, sourced our oysters from him. And so we imported them, like I said, directly from Ireland. They are all third party batch tested for heavy metals and also to show what they're the nutrient levels actually are um, every serving contains roughly seven large oysters and there's about 12 pounds of oysters per bottle um, it's called oyster boom and you can find it on our website which is harder happier healthier.com um, if you use the code salt you will get a little discount on it and we do actually have a subscribe and save too but they're amazing um, people who take them we see people who like women uh, Breasts get more plump for men, erectile function improves. Some guys even notice like a change in size, overall energy. Um, I feel like I literally feel electric when I take them because it's just so many good minerals coming in. They're, they're like the only supplement that I take right now, if I'm being honest. All right. Well, you know, thanks for sharing. I'll make sure to include the links in the show notes uh, for the, you know, that supplement for the Facebook group, uh, for even for the uh, Instagram channel and or instagram profile i'm actually not on instagram so i don't even know is it called an instagram channel or profile i know youtube it's a youtube channel but i'm not sure what they re refer to it on, on instagram so <laughs> it's just a page my instagram page yeah okay so i'll make sure to include uh, any links that you want i'll include in the show notes and yeah well thank you thank you so much dr sabrina for uh, sharing your insights on the carnivore diet you know, I definitely learned a lot and I, I'm sure those listening will also gain a lot of value from it. Well, thank you so much for having me. This was fun and I, I hope your listeners really enjoyed it too.